Price Explain. If you would like to open your books to page 24, I am going to be referring to section 3. And this is a long section. There's a lot of stuff in there. It's all good stuff. So hopefully I can just explain some of the vocab words for you. Um, and you can just have a little bit better understanding. First, I wanted to draw your attention to page 24 at the top. Um, do any of you remember doing this in Mrs. Usowitz's fourth grade class where you colored a butterfly and you hid it in the room and um, somebody would come and find them? Yes, so we actually took this activity because you learn about adaptations in fourth grade as well. So that's pretty exciting. I wish we could do that again. Uh, maybe you could do something like that at your house and have your brothers or sisters or your mom or dad find it for you. Um, that could be fun. Just remember where they are so you don't lose them. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to start on page 25. And it talks about adapting to the environment. Now the first thing that I think is a little controversial um, is natural selection. And that says, it talks about when animals are better suited um, in an environment than others are. And they say that eventually that might help um, either help the animal or it will cause them to lose their life because they are not equipped for where they live. However, I truly believe that most animals are placed exactly where they need to be and God created them with the correct adaptations um, to live where they need to be. So that's something that I'm kind of on the fence about. But as long as you know what the vocab word is, that's all I'm concerned about. So the next thing is adaptations. And those are the behaviors and physical characteristics that allow organisms to live successfully in their environments. So, for example, um, a red-tailed hawk. I can see that in the picture there. It's going to have these nice big talons, or claws, I guess, to be able to get the animals in the desert. Um, and they also have ways of keeping cool. Um, the elf owl, you can see him inside the cactus there. He is small enough to live inside the cactus, and so that um, is an adaptation that he is. He's not big like most owls are, so you can read through those. Um, the next vocab word that we come across is niche. It's N-I-C-H-E, but it's pronounced niche. And this is the role of an organism in its habitat, okay? So you might really love art, and we might say that that's your niche. Okay, it's something that you really like to do. You might really love to play sports, and that's your niche. When it comes to jobs, like I'm a teacher, and that's something that I love to do, so that's kind of my niche, something along those lines. And so this um, describes an animal in the way um, it tells what type of food it eats, how it eats, and what other organisms use this organism as food, because... We'll get into this later, but you remember the food chain. Usually animals are eaten by other things as well. So I'm going to turn the page. I'm on page 26 now. And we come across something, sorry, that says competition. Um, and they give three examples of different birds that live in the same tree. Okay, so competition is the struggle between organisms to survive as they attempt to use the same limited resource. So in this case, the tree and what it provides is the limited resource. They all live there, but you'll notice that the Cape May Warbler lives at the top of the tree and he likes the tips of the branches to eat. The Bay Breasted Warbler lives in the middle of the tree and then the Yellow Rumped Warbler lives at the bottom. So these birds can live in harmony together and hopefully they, you know, kind of stay in their own spot and they're not competing for food. Kind of like people are competing for toilet paper at Costco right now. <laughs> it's first come, first serve. Okay, so animals, unfortunately, because they're all living, you know, in close proximity to each other, um, they will experience competition for food for homes, for resources, things like that. 
All right, and on page 27, this should bring you back to your fourth grade year, um, where we talk about predators and prey. Okay, the predator is the animal that does the killing, and the prey is the animal that is killed. Now, some animals can be both. Sometimes a prey can turn into a predator if it's going for something smaller than it, um, and vice versa, okay? Now, some animals are really only predators, like they don't have much, um, they don't really become prey very often because there's other animals that just don't eat them, okay? So, um, I like the next section there. It says the effect of predation on population size. Um, it may seem like a bad thing for predators to eat prey, but if they didn't, two things would happen. One, the predator would die out because they are not eating food. Okay, they have to eat as well. And two, the prey, that population would get so big because nobody's eating him that it would cause other issues. So even though it may be sad if you've watched documentaries or whatever, I've been watching a few at home. If you have Disney Plus, um, there are some good Nat Geo um, documentaries that I've been watching recently. And yeah, it's sad to see a bunny get killed by a hawk. However, if that wasn't happening, you'd have so many bunnies and then they would be eating other people's food or other animals' food and it just creates a big mess, okay? So that's why it's important to have predators and prey. Now I'm going to turn to page 28 and talk about some of the adaptations, some of the changes in the bodies of these animals that allow them to either be predators or prey. Um, so it says they usually have adaptations that help them um, catch and then kill their prey. It says, for example, a cheetah can run very fast. Um, to help it catch its prey. A jellyfish um, can sting little tiny water animals, okay? A jellyfish seems pretty harmless, but it is not if you get stung. So that's how it's killing its prey. And also some plants too, which is really weird. Um, but it says the sundew is covered with sticky bulbs on the stalks. So when a fly lands on it, it remains snarred in the sticky goo while the plant digests it. And I know somebody was talking about a Venus flytrap the other day, kind of along the same lines. This plant can make its own food, but it also likes to eat flies. So I don't know what's wrong with him. Okay, now some other examples. Their eyes, like an owl's eyes are huge um, because they need to be able to see in the dark. Um, bats, they have the picture of the bat there. And that uses echolocation or pulses of sound to help it hear when it can't really see at nighttime and that's how it catches its prey. And then going to the next part, the prey also have adaptations to keep themselves safe. Um, and so page 29 has some really good defense strategies um, that I like to cover. So the first one, if it looks like a snake, but it's not, it's called mimicry. When one animal looks like or mimics another animal, so you're not quite sure what it is. Okay, so this is actually a caterpillar made to look like a snake. Um, so it can trick its predators into being like, uh-oh, I don't want to eat you. You are a snake, not a caterpillar that I thought, but it's really a caterpillar. So mimicry is good. Protective covering is another one. They show, it's called a pangolin. Um, it looks kind of like an armadillo. An armadillo would be one, a turtle, where it has a hard covering that it makes it almost impossible to get into if it's covered like that. The next one would be false coloring. That's a moth on the picture there. Um, now, at nighttime, you might see those two blue dots and think that those were eyes of a bigger prey. And you're like, uh-oh, I don't need to deal with him. Okay, so they have some sort of coloring to make them seem bigger or different than they really are. Camouflage is an easy one. That little leaf bug there. Um, it's not a leaf, but you really couldn't tell if you didn't see his head. Um, you know, we've talked about some other animals that have camouflage as well. Like a chameleon is a very obvious one. 
And then warning coloring. That's a grasshopper, and he's brightly colored because he says, I am poisonous. You don't want to eat me. I know that poison dart frogs are usually very brightly colored as well. They don't want to be eaten because they will poison their prey, so or their predator. So if the predator still eats them, joke's on them, I guess. All right, turn the page. Last section here. It's called symbiosis. And this is a close relationship between two species that benefits at least one of the species. So when two animals are living together, sometimes it's good for both of them, sometimes it's good for one of them, and when we talk about parasitism, it is only good for one and actually harms the other. So the first relationship is called mutualism. That's like when both species benefit. Um, let's see, they talk about the saguaro. Uh, yeah, so the saguaro cactus and the long-eared bats. The bat benefits in this relationship because the cactus flowers provide them with food. They eat like nectar. But the saguaro benefits because its pollen is carried to another plant on the bat's nose. So these two work together and they're in a mutual, mutual relationship, which means that they both want to be in the relationship and they are both benefiting from it. It's a good thing. Now the next one is commensalism. And this is where one species is being helped and the other species is not necessarily being helped, but it's not being hurt either. So the one that they gave the example of um, is a hippo, okay, and the three, they have yellow-billed oxpeckers, which are birds, and what they do is they cruise on the hippo's back and they'll eat any of the bugs that are, or ticks that are living on the hippo's skin. So the hippo would be okay, I guess, if the ticks, like, bit him, it probably wouldn't be nice. But the oxpeckers come and that's their food and so they just kind of hitch a ride and like they are benefiting from it even if the hippo quite isn't. And then the last one is parasitism. Uh, so you have a parasite and a host. Okay, this is like um, a tick or a flea on a dog or a cat. Um, it can uh, really affect the dog or the cat. Um, and so parasites sometimes live inside the body, such as a tapeworm, which is disgusting. And um, if it lives too long in a dog, like it could eventually kill them. So a parasite, um, well, I guess it doesn't, I don't know. It says, uh, unlike a predator, a parasite does not usually kill the organism it feeds on. Oh, here's why. So it doesn't necessarily kill them. It tries not to at least. Here's why. If the host dies, so the dog that has the tick, if he dies, well then the, the tick dies too, the parasite dies too, because there's nothing to feed off, off the dog anymore. If the tick was eating the blood of the dog and the dog dies, then sorry, you're going to die too. Okay, so they try not to. Unfortunately, it does sometimes happen, um, but most, if not all of the time, a parasite is a bad Thing. And the host does not want it around. So I hope that explains a little more for you. Um, there's some good like pictures in here. Make sure you go back and read the, the captions in there of each of the pictures. Um, if you wanted to look up some things about predator and prey, I'll see if I can link some things to you as well. But make sure you read it. Um, there's a lot of vocab words in there. Maybe make yourself some flashcards, but thanks for watching and I'll talk to you later.